All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Elisa Jacobson, AJ. It's uh, August 16th, 2023. We're at Northwest Wine Company in Dundee. Elisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, the first question to get things started is why wine? Ooh, why wine? Because I love the fact that you can take the something from agriculture, you can take something from the vineyard, grapes, and turn it into a product that you can enjoy every year. So it's kind of just this time capsule of, um, of each vintage. Uh, so I love that part of it, just that quick, that quick, like, this is what happened in the vineyard this year. Let's talk about life before wine for you a little bit. Life before where, wine. Where you were born and um, raised in your early life. Yeah, so I actually, my first year making wine, I was 19, so I actually couldn't drink wine. So it didn't come from my winemaking background. It didn't come from my love of wine. It was really um, my passion for agriculture and for um, the grape growing side of it. Um, so I grew up in a farming town. Um, I raised lambs and hogs and you know, did the 4-H and went to the county fairs and I really enjoyed um, how in, since I grew up in Northern California, I really enjoyed how um, big agriculture, like what a big industry it was in California. Um, but I love growing up around it. You know, I ran through the cornfields as a kid and it just has like fun memories. And I know that all of that corn, I grew up in Brentwood, home of the corn fest. And so I know that all of that, um, it turns into food, you know, it's like, uh, you know, now we see Brentwood corn on, on uh, restaurant menus because they really promoted themselves as being like good, local, organic, sustainable, which wasn't a thing when I was a kid, but it was something I was always thinking about. How can we do, you know, I saw like, I grew up around, um, around the uh, crop dusters that were like dusting the fields right next door to where I was living. And you're thinking like, you know, all that spray is getting on us and our house and our animals and our chickens and, you know, whatever we're eating. And you just, as a kid, you know, like, that doesn't seem right, but I don't know why or how. And I think all those kind of influences took me in the direction of, okay, agriculture is very important for, um, for California. I love the fact that it's so pure and and uh, we grow our own food and we eat it and you know it's it's kind of just like the human cycle but also i felt like there's some things that we're doing to because it's food there's some things that we're doing that could possibly be damaging the earth and damaging our bodies and so part of what i started learning or being passionate about was um was the want the want and the need to um try to use less herbicides less pesticides and be very um kind of what the direction that I've gone in with my own wine label Turning Tide is to be um, organically um, certified. Um, and even up here in Oregon, there's not as much, um, there's not as many people doing like the certifications, um, but they are doing like Oregon Live and they're farming in these like better ways. And I think that's super important. So kind of, um, Kind of all goes back around to a little bit of a soapbox I get on about talking about um, being more sustainable and, and uh, living and farming in more of a um, sustainable and organic way. Um, so kind of a combination of all those things. And I feel like I can use my wine label Turning Tide to talk about some of those things um, that are important to me. So what prompted you to start down the wine path? Um, so I went to school at UC Davis, um, and I was taking a bunch of agriculture classes. I worked in the hog barn at 8 a.m., and all my friends were like, you're crazy. You're leaving the bar at, you know, early because you have to be in the hog barn tomorrow morning. I'm like, yep, I'm going. Uh, so I was always pretty motivated and dedicated to, like, my, you know, sort of my passions. And, um, and I sort of just felt like this is, this is a direction um, I loved the wine industry, when I first, the first kind of uh, foot in the door was when um, I went to a job fair at UC Davis and to try to figure out, okay, which direction do I want to go in? I don't know, I'm 17 when I went to college, I didn't know which direction to go in. Um, but I met a bunch of people that worked in the wine industry and I got, I ended up getting a job um, for Harvest at a winery in Sonoma County. Um, that's when I, yeah, that's when I was 19 and couldn't even drink wine, but I enjoyed um, that thorough part. I enjoyed having something that was a kind of a, this natural product and that you could turn it into something. It's not like a strawberry jam that you're not, you know, like 
that's not vintage related and it doesn't necessarily like really show where it came from. I love that wine showed where it came from. This is, you know, Oregon Pinot tastes so much different than, you know, any other AVA in California, which is why I love my Oregon Pinot and we bottle Oregon Pinot up here. Um, so I just loved like how it really encapsulated where it came from. Tell me, tell me about that first harvest experience. What did you think of the work? First harvest? Um, I worked in the lab um, and you know I loved my science and so I got um, I got a good dose of like oh wow this is like really full-on like science. I don't think I realized that when the, when I first got into it. Microbiology and chemistry and and um, I liked that kind of deep dive. Um, I loved how passionate the people were about what they were doing. I um, also have always felt like you, if you have to work, you better enjoy what you're doing. And I felt that at a young age, like, oh, you, just, you gotta spend your entire life working. You better, it better be part of like who you are, your lifestyle, what, and then people that you wanna enjoy. And somehow at an early age, I kind of always felt that and I'm still trying to do that myself now. But at that early age, I saw everybody I worked with at that winery that they enjoyed their work. They were really passionate. They loved their chemistry and science. I could learn a lot from them. You know, I had a lot of um, kind of different like um, influences, I guess, at that stage. People I still know and still talk to on a regular basis from my very first job. Um, so I just felt like, you know, this is like, this feels like a good industry to be in. Uh, where people really enjoy what they do. So you're already at UC Davis at this point. Did that change the focus of your studies or did you still yeah. have something else in mind? Mm -hmm. Because I started um, at agriculture economics knowing that I wanted to be in ag somehow. I just didn't know where. So that job experience um, definitely showed me this would be a good place to go. Even if I don't end up being a winemaker or being a vineyard manager, you know, which direction I wanted to go in. I knew that that... Um, it seemed like the industry was pretty well-rounded, you know, the science background, like, this is pretty cool. I love this stuff. Um, being able to be outside, not sitting in an office all day, like, that was definitely one of my, <laughs> one of my MOs. Um, and, um, you know, that when you're 19, like, you don't know where you're going to go move after you graduate from college. And it, like, everywhere that, where vineyards are grown and where wineries are, they're not bad places to live. <laughs> So it kind of all just felt like a good lifestyle choice um, to make at that time to kind of have that like, um, and, or kind of a play on words, but that true north, right? Like, okay, what do I want? I, I want this like lifestyle. So I'm gonna go this direction and see what happens. <laughs> and so that was sort of a good um, decision-making um, motive at that time, I guess. So what came next for you then? Um, so after I, after I graduated, I, um, so I'm a big scuba diver. I've always loved the outdoors. My grandmother taught me how to, my grandmother was one of those like, actually both of, both of my grandmothers were very strong, independent females. Like one of them, uh, she came from three generations of females going to college, which was unheard of at that time. Um, but then my grandmother, the other side that she taught me how to, she didn't go to college because she had to grow up on a farm and her mom needed her to work and they, but you know, she read and she always was really well, kind of always wanted to um, keep learning and keep trying to do more and whatnot. And um, she didn't even know how to swim until she was 65. Uh, but she's like, I gotta learn how to swim. I grew up in I Iowa, like, you know, there's no, where to, there's no lakes out there. So when she moved to California, I'm gonna learn how to swim. I'm gonna learn how to dive. And so my 65 year old grandmother like started scuba diving in the coldest ocean in all of like the US and you know, Northern California, like super cold, whatever. Sharky, dangerous. Um, but she was sort of an inspiration for teaching me how to, how to scuba dive and then how to enjoy the, enjoy the ocean and enjoy your surroundings and be in the moment and, and um, you know, kind of uh, enjoy life. Um, so that experience, just from growing up and camping and whatnot with her, made me like get into scuba diving. So when I was in college, I started learning how to do that. Uh, so where did I want to go when I left college? I want to go to Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, so I did a harvest over there. Um, 
but really just so I could make money and go on the Great Barrier Reef and go diving. Um, so I did that. Um, came back and started working at Joseph Phelps. Um, and my, the winemaker at the time at Joseph Phelps um, was Sarah Gott and her husband was Joel Gott. And I met Joel Gott, uh, who I worked for for 20 years, um, because he was catering and he was, um, he was catering our harvest lunches. And he remembered me because I was like the only girl that worked in the cellar. There's no other girls, of course. Um, and I also uh, don't eat meat. And so he, re I eat fish. Um, and so he always remembered like, I have to bring fish for that girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it worked out because I was memorable. And then when they had their, when the Sarah was pregnant with their first baby, they had, um, they called me up to have lunch and Joel had a, uh, Joel has restaurants, he owns restaurants. He was a restaurant guy, not really a wine guy. Uh, but he loved wine, he had a good palate, but he didn't know wine making. Um, but he was kind of being kind of a winemaker cowboy at the time and trying to like figure it out. And as they were growing and they were gonna have their first baby, they called me and said like, hey, come with to lunch, let's talk. And he told me at the time, you know, like this wine label's small, we only make, you know, 500 cases, there's not probably going to be much for you to do in the springtime, so you can come work for us for harvest, like go off, go travel, go scuba diving, whatever, come back, you know. And so I thought like, oh, this is kind of a pretty good thing. Like I get to go work and get three months sabbatical in the spring, but those sabbaticals never happened. It, was, <laughs> it became busy instantly. But I think with my personality, like I didn't let it happen either, even though I love traveling and um, and all that, but I also, um, motivated and, you know, really wanted to kind of take the business and run with it. Um, and so I became the Joel Gott, um, first employee, um, and went from 500 cases to where they are now, floor stacked at Costco. <laughs> um, so pretty crazy with, uh, when I left, um, in 2020, I had a staff of 35 and, we were making um, many different skews of wine and it was a wild ride, but I learned a lot and traveled a lot. I did end up traveling a lot, but mostly for work. I was making wine all over the world, which was great, like super good experience. Um, so yeah, who knew that that was where I was gonna end up for 20 years. Before we get to that, I'm curious about your Australia experience. Uh, did, what was different about about being there than you were your kind of initial experience? What did you take away from your travels abroad, your first travel abroad? Um, I think well, there's different varieties for one thing, so that's always it's always good to to learn that part of it. Um, but those, so in the U.S. and California, especially even more than here in Oregon, um, you know, we have a lot of Hispanic labor. Um, they don't have labor in, in Australia. And so there was a lot of mechanization. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. So the winery was pretty automated. Um, there weren't that many employees. Um, the vineyards were set up way, I mean, they were way ahead of where we are for um, vineyard mechanization for between pruning and picking and everything. Um, I mean, there was like four guys picking thousands of acres of a vineyard and at that time so that was in 01 we didn't have that here I mean people are barely getting in the high in the more premium sectors and you know Oregon's just getting into it a little bit here they're just talking about buying another machine harvester uh, here earlier today when we when we um, popped in but you know that's mechanization is pretty new for premium areas but that wasn't the case there so I think I think I saw some of that and realized, wait, why aren't we doing this? <laughs> this actually makes a lot of sense, some of this mechanization. Um, and you're never gonna put people out of jobs. You just, like I always think that technology is a good thing and you know, raising the bar is a good thing and learning more is a good thing. You just have to um, um, kind of adapt and, and shift with it instead of being scared of it. You know, like how AI is right now where everybody's like, oh, AI is gonna, AI is gonna take my jobs. Like, no, it should just make you better at your job. You know, you should just get better, smarter, you know, and like shift around. And I think that's kind of how technology was with the wine industry. Um, it's a pretty like kind of um, 
I don't know, how would you say it? Like a primitive industry kind of like it's very, um, we still want to do things that are very simple, like in Europe and, you know, we don't want to, we feel like technology is almost like a bad thing, but, um, I've never felt that way. So tell me about the, you obviously mentioned the, the GOTS and uh, you starting off with the, the first employee at, a, at a, what was then a very small brand. So tell me about what your kind of initial role was and what the what the brand was doing at the time you started. Um, it was based in Napa Valley. Um, we weren't really outside of Napa. Um, maybe a little bit in Lodi at the time, but we definitely weren't in Southern California and the Central Coast yet. Um, and yeah, so it was small. Joel's dad was in the industry as well. Joel's dad had started a bunch of wineries, and so Joel sort of knew it from growing up in the wine industry um, and knew he liked it, but um, always had a good sense of um, sales and restaurants. And he met, um, Joel met our distributor, which is the same distributor that I currently use for Turning Tide, uh, when he was... Um, stocking a local wine shelf because uh, Joel and his parents used to own a kind of high-end deli market um, and they had a wine section there. Um, and when he worked there, um, he met this distributor that I still use today. Um, so just kind of some of that stuff's pretty cool because that was, um, so Joel met the Skernicks uh, who are f from Long Island, New York, um, in um, that must have been around 2000. Um, and they've really grown their their uh, distributorship, but they also are still family owned. And so there's also still like this like comfort level of, of working with them because um, I started with them in 01. So I've known them for that long too. So as soon as I left Joel Gott, they uh, wanted to um, rep my brands because we've known each other for a long time. So I think, you know, some of that stuff is it's pretty cool that even when you get bigger, you still have these like kind of smaller family connections. And um, I think some of those things are great about the about the wine industry. Um, we are always doing custom crush. So places like we're at today, um, Joel Gott never had a winery, never had their own like kind of brick and mortar, um, which at the time, like when we first started was pretty unique. Everybody was like, well, where's your tasting room? Like, oh, we don't have one. <laughs> we custom crush, we rent tanks. And that was so bizarre to people. Um, but a lot of people, you know, as like, as we got into the, um, you know, 10 years later, say, uh, there's a lot of wine brands that are like that. A lot of wine brands that don't have their own kind of brick and mortar that were just a label and wine and the style. And, and um, so I think we were ahead of our times when it came, when it came to that. Um, we sort of realized like, you know, you can, you can rent tanks at places like Robert and Laurent's place. And um, you don't have to have your own staff to deal with all that. So it was much kind of like a way to make wine that was um, value-based because you didn't have to pay for the brick and mortar in your wine bottle. So we could make wine that was, you know, $20 or less. Um, and it got out to the people. So I think that was pretty cool. I, I really enjoyed that coming from a uh, coming from Joseph Phelps thinking like oh we made insignia we made this like crazy high end like Napa Valley wine and I kind of had that in my head of like isn't that what you isn't that the pinnacle that's what you want to do when you're a winemaker you want to make these like crazy high end wines and then it kind of took me a little while to realize no actually it's pretty cool to make great wine that is available to the masses you know that you can make for you can make um basically try to figure out ways where you can make it a little bit cheaper and but still get good quality in the bottle and let people enjoy it so I, I do still feel like some of those things are being carried through in what I'm what I'm doing there um, I mean rare north is supposed to be a value brand as well um, less than $25 a bottle and you know delicious and I got a the for the 21 got a 93 from the wine enthusiast like for like a $23 bottle of wine that's pretty good <laughs> like that's but that's what I want like enjoy this wine you don't have to overthink it um it's just delicious good well-made wine and represents where it came from and kind of keep it simple but I got some of those like values from 
from the Joel God experience for sure. Tell me about uh, being there through all the through the growth and seeing the seeing the scaling and how did your role change and sort of how did you adapt to the brand as it got bigger and bigger? Um, as you grow, um, I still tried to figure out how to maintain quality, and that was always the challenge of how do you make the same uh, quality of wine at the two ton level as the 20 ton as the 200 ton as the you know 20,000 ton how do you still you know kind of like hand make that wine at a big scale um that was always a challenge um because there's always going to be people that like push against you and sort of say like why are you using this um you know basically like why are you putting so much like time and effort into this one tank it's just going to go into a giant blend but I always felt like well, every little piece is important and we should really be like dialing in our quality and making sure that like every tank matters <laughs> basically. Um, so that it was always a challenge because there's a lot of um, pieces and logistics. And so I started hiring a team that could watch those, the day-to-day -day winemaking and I taught them so that I could kind of oversee the, the logistics of making wine in all over California and Oregon and Washington and South America and Spain. And um, so I definitely needed a team to do that. But that became fun too. It was, as you learn and grow, I think it's fun to like teach other people what you, what you learned. Um, and I never really felt like I had a specific mentor. I learned a lot from a lot of people um, and I took it all in. But I tried to like change my approach to try to be like a mentor for other people, um, since I didn't necessarily feel like I like specifically had that of like exactly what I wanted to do. So, and I think with also with uh, females in the ag industry, it's it was challenging. I had to try to figure out like how do I talk to these like all these uh, male you know wine growers out there. And I'm this young 20 year old, whatever female. And, you know, how do I get them to listen to me, to respect me, to trust me, you know? So I kind of had to figure all that stuff out along the way, um, which I did, but I also wanted to help like my next generation of my team not have to go through that struggle that I went through. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed that part of it. Um, kind of like hiring a team. I had a lot of females in my team and yeah, teaching them and showing them like, well, this is what I did. Everybody's going to have a different approach, but this is how an example of like how I figured it out. This is how I got there. Um, so I really changed from day-to-day -day winemaking to like hiring other people that were doing that, but then managing that staff to, you know, kind of grow and, and learn. So obviously when you get into winemaking, I don't think a lot of people get into winemaking for, for management necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about that development for yourself, the evolution of hiring, training, mentoring. Uh, was it something that came naturally to you or what, what did you have to kind of learn along the way? Um, I don't know if that ever comes naturally to anybody. <laughs> and everybody, like, I always laughed whenever I interviewed people that said, like, I want to be a manager. I'm like, but do you really? <laughs> Does anybody really want to be a manager? <laughs> you clearly haven't done it yet. Um, but I took the, I took the pieces that, um, that I felt like I was weaker in and I really tried to, I read a lot. I listened to a lot of podcasts. I, um, I tried to like, I drove all over the place, you know, all over California. So, uh, you know, audio books were like amazing for all my car rides up and down 101 and up and down five and all the way up here. And, um, yeah. So I read and listened and, and uh, joined a couple. Actually, I was in a, um, I was just telling Sean earlier today about the manager's round table that I was in, um, that Robert, uh, he helped me get into that round table and it was a, a lot of other um, GM type, you know, managers from, uh, from Oregon. Um, and that kind of stuff's good, you know, hearing from other people, what their experiences are, how did they deal with it? How did they like get through these things? Um, but I think that's one of the things that, uh, when you get good at what you do, you get promoted to manager, but then like nobody went to college to be a manager. So then all of a sudden you're like in a role that you didn't get trained for. <laughs> so I just had to 
try to try to train myself, I guess. Um, I en I enjoyed it for a, for a while. Um, at the end, I was definitely ready to like pass the rain off and to you know kind of get back into more like day to day winemaking, which is what I'm doing now again. Um, but I think that was a you know good time of my uh, good time of your career. I mean, I would encourage anybody to to do that for a period of time because I think you learn a lot about yourself and a lot about you know interactions with people and communication and all those things. You mentioned kind of the, the globe trotting nature of your winemaking. Tell me about how that came to be and how you managed making wine in that way, all those different places at the same time. Um, so probably the most memorable or places I went to the most was uh, Chile and Argentina. Um, and I, um, somebody I still work with, like day one of my Joel Gott career, I had to go... Um, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into necessarily. It was just kind of like, oh yeah, come work with us. Um, and day one, Joel tells me like, oh yeah, don't meet me at the office. Like you're going to Lodi, which, you know, in my mind is like giant, hot winery. Like, where am I going? I'm from Napa Valley <laughs> and you're going to go bottle some jugs. <laughs> like, wow, I didn't really read the job description very well here. So I'm like, insignia to jug wine. Um, so I went out and I met with Joel's partner, Roger. And the cool thing is like, Roger and I still work really closely today and he's um, helping me sell this wine actually right now. Um, and so it was a, a great sort of, uh, yeah, we have known him for 25 years now. So we work together really closely still. Um, but so they started this wine brand called Three Thieves uh, that, that was like stealing wine from the rich and giving to the poor. So it was still kind of that like mentality of like, let's make good wine, let's put it in a jug, let's make it fun. Um, and it actually ended up being like, uh, being a really cool thing. So through that experience, I actually went with Roger, the next trip we did a few months later was over to Italy and we, we packaged um, catcher packs. And that was like the first, we were the first people to actually package wine in a catcher pack in the US. Um, in South America and, uh, and Italy, um, in Europe, Tetra Packs are known for being like kind of like cheap wine. Um, so same thing, we were trying to make like wine that was good. Um, we put like Napa Valley Cab in a jug, you know, and like, like, don't take yourselves too seriously. It's wine guys, like, let's have fun with it. Um, so the Tetra Pack was kind of the same thing. And also a Tetra Pack is very like environmentally friendly. Um, it's way more sustainable than glass. And so I, I like that. I'm like, how can, this is, this is actually pretty cool. Um, more recyclable and way less weight as far as, uh, as far as shipping around and whatnot. So we kind of started there, but then that the three thieves turned into, um, also some projects down in South America. So I actually went down there more than, than Italy. Um, and did a Malbec from Argentina, did Pinot Noir from the coast of Chile, which is very similar to Pinot Noir from the coast of California. Um, so that was really fun just because everybody makes wine a little bit differently. Everybody has different ideas. So I think all those experiences, you just sort of, you're just gathering. I always like learning. So I think you're always gathering information from all these different places and these different winemakers you're working with and, and, uh, taking little bits and pieces from all of those experiences to create what I'm doing now. Well, before we get to the individual projects, I'm curious, you mentioned winemaking style and about sort of creating it along the way. Did you have in mind when you started making wine, did you have a, a particular style or a particular kind of signature you were going for? And, and it, it has that changed? Um, I did a little bit because I have, because I made so much wine over my career, I had a lot of ideas, but in, in the Joel Gott world or, you know, whatever your like kind of big winery world would be, people are used to, um, they want consistency. So once you create one thing, that's it. You have to keep creating that same thing. Um, and so after a while, you know, to me, I'm like, I want to learn something. I want to do something different. Um, but if you're in a, you know, if you're a Costco brand, people don't look at vintages. They don't know the difference between appellations. So you're really making wine that's very consistent, which is also a challenge in itself. Um, but after a while, I felt like, okay, I have all these ideas of what I want to do and I, I need a venue to do them. Um, and so 
what I wanted to go for was, um, I mean, Joel Gott was always balanced um, and always kind of on the lower in alcohol side, I would say, but what I'm doing is lower in alcohol even, um, finding places that are um, vineyards that um, are in more cooler climate so I can pick at lower bricks, lower sugar, meaning I can get lower alcohol um, in the final product. Um, and so I really, I really like focused on those styles being able to come from the central coast where it's cooler in California and then Oregon for, um, for Pinot and soon to be Pinot Gris. Um, I really felt like the climates in those two areas fit the style I wanted. So lower in alcohol and being able to get ripeness at these like maturities, um, being able to get maturity at uh, lower sugar levels. So you can get lower alcohol, um, good bright acid. Um, I also um, wanted to make sure that all the wines, um, like Rare North is all live certified. I wanted to make sure like the California wines um, were organic and or like SIP certified, which is like their version of life. Um, and then I've kind of evolved even to um, be that most of my turning tide wines I have in California now are organically certified. Um, so that would be the evolution I would say is um, the style is, is still similar, kind of that um, no sugar, lower alcohol, um, not big fruit bombs, some savoriness too. Kind of the balanced style, but also um, the way that it's farmed. Um, and then just continuing to push the growers and to push, to push more um, certification and more um, uh, sustainable practices. Um, so every year trying to evolve that piece of it. So start with Turning Tide and tell me about how that came to be. What, what, point, did that, what point did your own brand become something you were interested in? Um, Turning Tide actually started in Oregon um, because a lot of people up here do farm in the philosophy that I was interested in. Um, California loves their Roundup. They love their Monsanto. <laughs> it's, it's cheap and they spray it everywhere. Um, and a lot of people up here, um, you know, for different reasons, um, we're really more into um, trying to farm um, in better ways. And there was this vineyard that I was buying, um, Eniola Amity, I was buying it for Joel Gott, but it was going to this big blend. And the fruit was so good. Uh, the grower was awesome. They were farming it um, in an organic manner, not certified, um, but they were farming it in an organic manner. And I thought like, this fruit is amazing. Like I want to try to make it in my style and keep it separate and see how that looks. So actually Oregon was my first, um, 2017 was my first Oregon Pinot um, that I did. And I, can, I still do it. Um, that same vineyard to this day. That's a that's a small like hundred case lot. It's um, uh, fun, like more premium, and I still wanted to kind of continue that. But because it's a single vineyard, I can't really grow it, which is why I turned uh, into rare north so I could have two um, kind of Oregon wines. One's a single vineyard, um, and then one that shows off like Willamette Valley. So I feel like Rare North really shows like, this is Willamette Valley. This this is like all the pieces. Um, there's like the um, sort of like fruitier Shehala Mountain in there. There's uh, this vineyard. I, I um, manage a vineyard down in the new um, uh, Mount Pisgah AVA. Um, super cool climate down there, like good body, good structure. There's some of that in there. So I feel like all those pieces are kind of coming together in Rare North to really show off like this is a true Willamette Valley blend where my um, Turning Tide uh, Eola Amity like feels like Eola Amity. Um, so I think that's like a fun differentiation between those two. But yeah, so Turning Tide started in, um, in Oregon. What's different about making your own wine? Uh, I get to define my style. Um, also, um, I think you know, for me, packaging, I didn't really know that part very well <laughs> and marketing and whatnot, but you know, Sean's helped me with that too. Um, so I think that's, that's just a part where I've had to like flex and stretch to, okay, what, it, what does that look like? What do people want? What do people want to see on the label? Um, so that's different. Um, 
But yeah, being able to have my own style and being able to just work with people I want to work with. I only want to work with this vineyard. This guy's farming organically, and it's somebody that I um, respect. And, you know, I don't have to work with people I want to work with anymore. Turning Tide, tell me about the name, the packaging, the the look, the style, what you're, what you're going for with it, and how that has sort of gone for you so far. Um, it was definitely um, my sort of... Uh, personality brand um it was what i wanted to make sure turning tide play on words of like you know turning the tide on climate change making sure we're trying to be more sustainable um a little bit of my um a little bit of my brand to be a, a soapbox on that stuff um trying to push the envelope on getting people to farm more organically um which comes with you know people kind of always um there's a lot of people that say like, oh, it's all for marketing, like, but you could turn marketing into a good thing. So if, if I can get, if I can sell more wine, if I can get more accounts that want my made with organic wine, then I have to get more vineyards to farm that way. And then the end result is a good thing. Um, so it's all kind of all around that. Um, I also, um, because of my diving background and loving the ocean and I think, you know, where I, where I started the farming part of what I wanted to make sure we were farming well on was not putting um, harsh chemicals into our waterways. Um, so basically like protecting the fish. Um, I know like uh, Oregon and Washington have, you know, salmon safe and whatnot. I think that they do a great job. Um, and that's exactly like where my mind was always at with um, trying to make sure that we're protecting our waterways because uh, water is life. Um, so Turning Tide kind of has all of, all of those things encompassed in that. Um, the dandelion on the front is really like the, the sum of all the parts, all the pieces that go into the, um, into the wine. So there's a lot of like depth in all the different like branding pieces. The, the artist um, was a local, when I lived up in um, Northern California, she was a local artist that did a lot of um, designs in the area. So it was just like, sort of fun to work with another female. Um, and that she turned my story into an image, really like, oh, this is you. <laughs> like, I'm gonna create an image that's all that stuff you just talked about. And she did. So that was kind of where, uh, where Turning Tide came from with the. Uh, yeah, trying to be like kind of um, making sure that yeah we're protecting the earth and and then just really like encompassing all the things that go into that go into wine. And then with with Rare North, you mentioned like wanting to kind of expand the vision for Oregon wine. So tell me about how the second brand came to be. Um, I even though um, the area that I work in the most in California is the Central Coast and and um, Santa Barbara County. And there's a lot of great Pinot that comes out of Santa Barbara County. I still just felt like Oregon Pinot is more of my style, more like back to that. You can really pick it at a lower alcohol. It's got great maturity and it's got good um, structure and flavor for being, for being able to pick at low maturities. Um, so I really felt like that was the Pinot I wanted to, to wanted to showcase more, uh, just because I felt like it was more it was more my style. But I grew up coming to Oregon. Like Oregon, if you're a Northern California girl like me, Oregon was our backyard. I came up here three times a year. Like I know the Oregon coast pretty well. Like I felt like it was it was my backyard as much as anywhere else was. Um, so I always felt like home up here. Everybody up here is super friendly and like it has you know, great values on the um, ways that I believe in farming and eating and all that. And it just always felt like it was, it was a second home. And then I bought a second home up here, so. And why, with, with, why here specifically? Why, why is it being made at Northwest Wine? Um, so in, when I was with Joel Gott, he wanted to, there was this brand called Kung Fu Girl that was um, Charles Smith and, uh, they were, we were kind of all, all friends back in that time. And um, Joel was like, well, can you go up and find some, you know, Riesling and start making like, you know, Joel got Kung Fu Girl? <laughs> like, sure, I'll, I'll try. Uh, so I found um, a winery in Washington to go work with. And I started working up in Washington more. 
Um, but what I realized, kind of being more in the Pacific Northwest and meeting more people um, in the area was like, I think Pinot Gris might actually be the better way to go than Riesling. Like there's already Riesling that's doing well, St. Michelle and Kung Fu Girl was always doing well. Um, but I started tasting some more Oregon uh, Pinot Gris. Like, well, why don't we try to be unique and do something a little different that's also delicious? Um, so I started, I met a few people down here in Laurent uh, that work, that's the owner of Northwest Wine Company here. Um, he uh, was one of the first people I met in the area. And um, Oregon being, you know, still being pretty small and still being a lot of like DTC and tasting rooms. Um, Laurent was a little bit bigger minded and always felt like, hey, if we can get more people selling Oregon wines around the country, it's better for everybody. Like, you know, the rising tide. So sure, let's, let's bring you in. Like you have this idea, your boss has this idea of trying to like, you have some good national distribution and we can bottle some Pinot and Pinot Gris for you. Like, let's do it. Um, let's get Oregon out there more. And that was back when, I mean, Oregon's done a great job to market themselves, but in 08, when I first started coming here, it wasn't like really on the map yet. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's kind of why I uh, bonded with Laurent and his staff here more is because they just sort of felt like we're going to get Oregon on the map. We really think that this is the place to be. And we want to show everybody in the U.S. how amazing Oregon wines are. Um, so we kind of all have that same mentality of like, it's not a bad thing to sell wines across the United States. Let's go. Let's get Oregon out there. Um, so yeah, we always, we always kind of uh, have the same mentality, I guess. You mentioned a desire to get back to kind of the hands-on winemaking with, with these brands after the career Joel got. So tell me about, has anything surprised you about getting back into that, this kind of winemaking after being in that, at that level for so long? I had to remember all my math, all of my equations, all of my, um, surprising. Um, I think it's probably, I probably knew it was good for me to, um, start going back to the basics again and figuring out like why I wanted to do certain things or why I wanted to, all of my wines are, are, um, vegan friendly. For example, there's a lot of products that, that, uh, are more animal based that I don't use and, I think some of those things I kind of had to get back in to realize, wait, what am, what are we adding to this wine? Cause I wasn't on the day to day staff anymore. Um, so I think just getting back to, back to the basics was a good thing. Um, and kind of re uh, assessing winemaking style and the whys and yeah, all the little details. I'm curious about, uh, obviously you've, you've been making wine in California and you're making wine in Oregon. Uh, smoke impact has obviously become much more of a thing that you have to deal with on an annual basis. Tell me about your kind of work with that and uh, how your style has come to kind of deal, handle that challenge. Oh, I could talk for hours on that. <laughs> um, in uh, 2008 uh, was our first big year of fires in California. Um, and because with Joel God, I was making wines from all over, all over California, all over the world. Um, and so I had experience with smoke impacts and knew it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> I knew a little bit went a long way. Um, and then 2017 was our next big fire event. And that's when I was living in Sonoma County. That's when Santa Rosa, the Kmart, you know, like burned down. Santa Rosa basically burned down the, you know, places, Atlas Peak. So that was our first like real big experience where it came back, um, came back to us. And then there was a fire every year after that, 17, 18, 19, 20, obviously the entire, you know, Oregon and California were on fire in 20. Um, so in 2018, because I had um, experience in 2017, I realized a lot of people just thought like, oh, we'll just pick this stuff and it'll be fine. And I tried to say like, no, no, we should do some testing. Like, well, it's not going to be fine necessarily. Um, and I realized just a lot of people didn't know what they were getting themselves into. So I, because of my experience working up here and working in Washington, I had a lot of contacts. And so I tried to bring people together saying like, you know what, California, Oregon, and Washington have the same problems. There's only one smoke 
research professor in each state, um, we should all try to work on this stuff together. Um, and so I made some phone calls and we started the um, West Coast Smoke Exposure Task Force from that. Um, and so it's a, it's a group of the uh, wine grape growers and um, winery associations from Washington, Oregon, and California now. Um, and we've, got, we've uh, been able to get um, money through the USDA, ARS, which is the Agricultural Research Service, um, to get money to those three professors to try to help with smoke exposure research. Um, we also supported their uh, SCRI grant, the Specialty Crop Research Initiative grants that um, Oregon State, uh, Elizabeth Tomasino at Oregon State was the main driver of that, but Anita um, Oboholster and then Tom Collins from Washington uh, were, you know, on that um, on that grant as well, and our committee supported um, them, and they they had to have a bunch of meetings to make sure they could get um, kind of industry on the same page on what industry needed for smoke exposure. Um, so we helped support them and all that. And we also helped support um, their um, uh, getting that information out to the industry. And so we hold, um, we hold what we call a smoke summit every summer that's, uh, um, that's virtual. Uh, we work with the USDA ARS and all of their um, smoke exposure researchers too to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page and we're not overlapping too much and everybody knows what the other people are doing. Because um, with like anything, communication is really hard. Um, and so what our task force is trying to do is make sure everybody is communicating. Um, so that's been like, it's been successful for sure um, as far as that goes. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Unified Grape and Wine Symposium in California. Um, and so part of what we, um, we put on, um, I think it's, uh, 30 sessions, educational sessions, um, in California in January. Um, but one of them again is going to be obviously on, um, you know, current smoke exposure. So it's part of trying to get that information back out to the industry. So not only like supporting the researchers, but then making sure that that information is getting back out to the industry. With the smoke and fires becoming more of an annual a, a annual challenge, have you seen progress made that makes you optimistic about the future of sort of how the wine industry will be able to handle it? Um, I think there is some good research. Um, I personally have moved to the central coast of California where there's less forest, so there's less things to burn. Um, so I did make my own personal shift because I was getting really frustrated with having to make wine in areas that burned every year. Um, but you know, that's not necessarily, so I, I think there probably is a combination of maybe some of these areas aren't as sustainable to like work in every year. Maybe vineyards can't be next to big forests because they, burn. <laughs> um, and we're even having issues with um, controlled burns. So they're doing more controlled burns now, which is great. But don't do controlled burns when there's grapes on the vines, right guys? <laughs> and so we're still like part of the task force and uh, we're working with some of those outside uh, industries to make sure that there's communication on that too. Like if you're going to do a controlled burn, let's talk about it and make sure that burn is before grapes are set in the, in the vineyards. Um, so I think there's a combination of that. And then the science is getting better for sure. Um, Elizabeth and Tom have uh, discovered some new compounds that are way more um, like sensory driven as far as they're, they seem to be more um, of that, like these are the compounds that really give that smoke effect. Um, and so you can't really, you can't make, um, you can't make a solution until you know what the problem is. And we didn't even know what the problem was as far as the compound. So Elizabeth and Tom have like really moved, made strides moving forward to figure out more of what the compounds are. Um, so yeah, just research takes time. And we only have one harvest a year, so that's challenging. Oh, the kind of cool thing about the USDA is they have a, what they're doing is they have some grapevines um, where they can harvest multiple times a year in these controlled um, greenhouses. So we are trying to do, you know, be able to do a few harvests in one year to still be able to do research, not just one time a year. 
Um, so yeah, I think there's some cool stuff happening for sure. So tell me about your new your new place in, central, in the Central Coast. What uh, what attracted you to that region, and what have you done there so far? The lack of fires. <laughs> um, I like the cool climate. I like that uh, the wines that come out of there are, we can get ripe at that lower bricks. I love that. Um, I love being close to the ocean and being um, closer to the, I mean, I always wanted to live by the ocean. Um, so uh, that obviously appealed to me. Um, and uh, I'm renting um, a winery that is in San Inez that's um, kind of old, like, uh, Spanish mission style winery. The grower, um, the owner of the winery, uh, is farming everything in kind of an organic, regenerative style. So it, you know, sort of matched my um, my ethos there too. Um, so it was a pretty like just fun opportunity. I think it's one of those areas, kind of like what I saw in Oregon too. Um, Napa and Sonoma, like everybody knows those places, but. I was looking for, you know, kind of the newer frontiers, like the places that weren't really like totally on the map yet, where you could get by like inexpensive economical fruit that was really good and still still be able to make those like good wines at a good price. Um, Napa and somewhere just, I mean, that's where I did most of my career and it's just so expensive there. You can't buy inexpensive grapes. Um, and I didn't want to make a $100 bottle of Cabernet. So you have a winery project in the Central Coast, you have winery project up here, you have a vineyard you're managing. How do you balance it all? How do you kind of, how do you spread yourself among the different projects you work on? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going fly fishing next week. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think um, work hard, play hard. I've always been in that mentality. You know, like work, get all your stuff done and then like go have fun. Um, stay busy. Staying busy is fun. Um, interacting with people. Um, yeah, I own two vineyards down in the center coast too. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mentioned the other committees that I'm on as well. So um, Oregon Wine Council, I'm on the board of that too. There's a few things going on. I don't know. <laughs> you just sort of do it. <laughs> oh, is there a Zoom meeting right now? Oops, okay. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Just sort of do it. Work hard, play hard. I feel even more honored that I got like an hour of your time today. This is this is very exciting. We're bottling, so we're multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, so you mentioned that Oregon was, you felt kind of like Oregon was a second home as you grew up. Tell me about the Oregon wine industry specifically. As you started to become aware of it, what were your initial impressions of it? Um, and the industry, the, the wines being made and the, and the people making them. Um, I thought that there was a purity to it, that uh, California was you know, further ahead um, in technology and winemaking and sales and, you know, more on the map kind of thing. But um, I felt like there was a, there was a real like purity to how people were making wine here and how they were farming here. And California was ahead, but ahead how they were, you know, spraying lots of Roundup everywhere. And, and uh, Oregon wasn't quite there yet. They didn't have there wasn't as many big vineyards. They didn't have to do that yet. Um, and so I think um, there was a lot of uh, like kind of simple ways that were good ways of farming. And now that Oregon is growing, I think they're kind of in the same, in the same boat of trying to figure out, you know, how do we grow and maintain quality? And I felt like I did that, you know, 10 years ago in, in my career, but I see that happening here now more like, you know, more vineyards, bigger wineries, more growth, um, which I think is a good thing, but they're in that same boat right now, I think, of trying to figure out how do we still maintain our quality and make more wine. Um, but I think that's a normal struggle of growth. What does the Oregon wine industry look like to you now, and, and where do you think it's going next? Um, well, there's been a lot of consolidation. Um, I do wish there were more... I've always been into like that family owned brand and the family owned, you know, industries and, you know, really, I mean, you know, really Laurent and Robert still do that for the most part here too. Um, but there has been a lot of consolidation and, uh, people realizing that Oregon's great quality and they, you know, like, uh, my, my Oregon brands do really well on the East coast. I think that, you know, East coast, uh, wine buyers, um, recognize the quality, um, 
mean, California is a little harder to sell Oregon wine in because there's so many, you know, California is loyal to California, but I think a lot of people realize the, um, the quality here. Um, I think it will continue to grow. I mean, it seems like uh, there's a big, um, big demand for Oregon Pinot and there's not much here. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge they have is just the amount of vineyards here. There's just not that many vineyards. There's not that much product. Um, so we'll see where that goes. I think there's always going to be a supply demand issue here because it is smaller. And I'm curious, obviously, you, you talked about some of the things you're interested in outside of wine. Tell me about what kind of other passions and hobbies outside of wine that, that keep you occupied. Um, I do love my diving. Um, I go around the world um, scuba diving um, and hanging out with the fish. Um, I, uh, yeah, just kind of being in the ocean, paddle boarding, you know, I love, I love being around the ocean for, um, for all that. I do just kind of in my personal time, I love to garden and, you know, create kind of like the wine thing. You create something out of your garden. Like my, my, um, my vineyard down in Santa Ynez has this giant quince tree on it. And so, you know, I get excited every year when I'm like, Ooh, I can go make quince jam out of it. Um, so I love that sort of stuff. Um, and playing around with that in my, in my free time. Your ample free time. Mm hmm So much. <laughs> well, with that, with that, what comes next for you? What are you looking to head to on the horizon? Any other projects, personal, professional things you're excited about? Um, I, I just tried um, some sparkling wine that I made up here um, that hasn't been disgorged yet, but uh, uh, it came from Laurent's Vineyard Highlands, um, which is live certified, and then Robert here, um, his vineyard that is on his house is a Pinot Blanc. Um, so Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. Um, so that'll be fun to have some sparkling wine out. Um, yeah, I think growing, um, I just partnered with a new company, same Roger guy that sent me over to Italy to help him bottle, to help him package Tetra Packs from when I was 22. Um, he's, a uh, he's got a sales company and so he's, um, helping me sell this rare North wine now. So I think just sort of exposing more people to, to good wine. Um, I think breaking that, breaking some of those barriers, um, that's part of what I try to do on the um, um, the Unified Grape and Wine Committee is is getting unique, different perspectives on the stage for speakers, not just like the same people you've heard from every year. Um, and last year for our keynote uh, luncheon speakers, we had the McBride sisters um, come up and talk about their experiences. And I think one of the things I thought that was really cool from that outcome was um, you know, they're saying like, people I grew up with, like, they didn't know how to use a corkscrew. Like, you know, don't make wine so complicated. Um, and I do feel like we do overcomplicate it. And I think just trying to make wine fun again and trying to um, show people that you don't have to take it so seriously, just enjoy it. Um, you know, trying to make sure that we're providing a product that is good quality, but also like, you know, none of the harsh chemicals, herbicides, et cetera, that are in the wine too. Um, but just something that's like, you can trust and know that it's gonna be good and, you know, not, not uh, all the wines are low in sulfur too. Um, and a lot of people have, uh, um, you know, issues with sulfur, et cetera. So I just kind of, you know, keeping it low on the additives, et cetera, that I think all works. Uh, last question for you. Uh, if someone were to ask you for your advice on entering into the wine industry or words of wisdom, what would you tell them? Oh, words of wisdom. Um, I think you have to have passion for these type of projects because they're not easy. <laughs> um, I think um, you need to make sure, I think getting the ag is hard because it's so weather dependent. It's so out of your control. Every year is different. So, you know, I think what we've all, what we all sort of talk about is like, you better love it because farming is not for the weak of heart. Um, and then I think just, yeah, being the wine industry in general, you're not going to get into it and think you're going to get like rich overnight. You know, that's not, <laughs> that's not a thing. Um, so I think it's got to be a lifestyle choice that you just enjoy. Right. That's all the questions that I have for you. Anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything that we didn't cover here today? Not that I can think of. I mean, I think I think overall, um, yeah, trying to make sure that we're getting um, 
we're getting wines, people to farm wines better differently, vineyards better differently, you know, less, uh, less um, herbicides, less harsh chemicals, and, uh, you know, all being trying to make sure that it's not like, you know, we're talking about kale. It's still wine. It's not a superfood, but we still want to make sure that we're um, treating our bodies well as far as, like, what we're, what we're putting in them and then how we're treating the, um, the planet as well. Um, and, yeah, just enjoy it and not take it too seriously. Have fun. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Sharing your story with us. Thank you, girls. Make yourself available today and uh, go ahead and let you off the hook. Thank you.